This week on The Communicators, a discussion on the Internet as a tool for gossip and what it means for protecting one's privacy. Our guest is author Daniel Solove, a law professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Daniel Solove is the author of The Future of Reputation, Gossip, Rumor, and Privacy on the Internet. It's a book that just came out. Dr. Solove, you quote a website owner in this book as saying, in this day and age, there is no privacy. Why is that? Well, we're really seeing a big threat to privacy today because this is one of the first times in history where anybody can publish anything to the entire world. Um, and to think about that, that's kind of amazing that nowhere before have uh, the average everyday person been able to write something and spread it around the globe like they can today with blogs and social network websites. Is that freedom or is that a lack of privacy? I think it's both. I think that on the one hand, I think it's wonderful. I blog myself. I think blogging is, is a, a wonderful thing to do. I also uh, think it's great that people are expressing themselves and, and telling about their lives and communicating with each other. So on the one hand, I think, fantastic. On the other hand, with everybody writing about their lives, they're also writing about their personal lives. They're writing about their intimate details. These are kids. These are teenagers and college students chronicling all the gossip that is swirling about them in high school and college. Uh, people's lives are intertwined with the lives of others, so they're writing about their friends, their families, their bosses, their teachers, and, and others. So it is uh, staggering the amount of information that is uh, coming online uh, that's personal about people. So what does that mean? Well, it means that people's reputations um, are going to be to some extent determined by this online information, that people are going to have information trails, fragments of information that can readily pull up in a Google search about them. And it's going to be very hard to escape mistakes in the past or if someone has uh, spread rumor about you. Um, it's really hard to escape that. And it can happen in an instant. Give us an example that's in the book. Well, one example is uh, what I have opening the book is, is the story of the dog poop girl. Uh, this is uh, a story uh, happened in South Korea. Uh, a young woman's on a train. She has a little dog. And the dog uh, poops on the train. And uh, she's in a hurry. She doesn't have time to clean it up. She leaves the train. But people think this is rude, as I think they have every right to think it's rude. But someone snaps her picture with a cell phone camera, puts it online. People identify her. People start supplying personal information about her. People start pouring in, attacking her, uh, criticizing her, uh, calling her, and harassing her. And she has to drop out of her university. The story goes worldwide. It's written about in, in papers throughout South Korea. It goes uh, to papers around the world. It's written about in the United States. So millions of people now know this woman as the dog poop girl. Forever, this rude act is enshrined on the internet. And she'll never escape that. Uh, so what's happened to her now? Where is she now? I have no idea, actually. Um, the story has kind of stopped, and, and I really don't know what uh, became of her. Um, when you talk about reputation, have people's reputations besides this woman been ruined by the Internet or, or changed or altered by the Internet? Oh, yes. Um, there's a, a story that actually happened here in D.C., uh, the Washingtonian case. A young woman, Jessica Cutler, who was working for a senator, blogged about her relationships with others, including sexual relationships with a number of people, uh, one of whom was uh, an attorney who was working in the senator's office. And when this blog was linked to by a very popular political blog called Lanquette, uh, the blog went prime time, and everybody started writing about it. The Washington Post had a story, for instance, in the uh, Post magazine. Uh, the New York Times wrote stories about it. Uh, she became very famous, uh, and she wrote a book about this and reveled in, in this fame. He, on the other hand, the person who was written about, uh, found this uh, very damaging to his reputation, and he sued her for uh, invading his privacy. And did he win? Uh, right now, the case is in uh, limbo because she declared bankruptcy. Is it a case that could set precedent? Is it a major case looking at the Internet? I think so. I definitely think that there's certainly a lot of law that exists pre-existed this, but this case is one of the early cases uh, 
that involves the use of a blog to spread information about people. So uh, I think that uh, there, it does raise certain interesting novel issues. You write that details about your private life on the internet can become permanent digital baggage, and you talk about Michael. Well, Michael is a, a guy who was written about, I believe it was in uh, a while back in, uh, I think, the Boston Globe. And, and uh, his story was uh, he wrote something, and he put something online when he was younger, and uh, that keeps coming back to haunt him. And uh, everyone he feels is, is uh, finding out this information by doing Google searches, and he notices that uh, uh, people treat him differently or you know, don't necessarily address the subject, but he thinks that they know about it. And he is quite upset that uh, he doesn't want to have the first impression, the very first thing when he meets someone new, to be talking about this particular incident. Um, should people be restricted, in your view, from putting that information online or being able to do a Google search on somebody? Well, uh, I think sort of yes and no. When it comes to putting your own information online, I think that people should be educated to be careful, but I think it's a little bit too paternalistic to stop someone. If you want to tell your life story, I think you should have the right to tell your life story, um, even if it might be foolhardy to put out too much information about yourself. I don't think the law should silence you from doing that. When it comes to putting information about other people, then I think we're uh, in, a, in a different world there because I think that is harming somebody else and it's not their decision, it's not with their consent to have that information up there. And I do think that they should have a remedy um, that you shouldn't be putting up people's personal information without their consent. But it's up there and it's out there, and such as the Korean woman. How do you get it back? Once it's really spread, um, it's nearly impossible to put the the genie back in the bottle. Before it goes far and wide, before it goes viral, um, there are certain things that you might be able to do to get it taken down and removed from the internet. Um, but yes, once it really takes off across the world and it's on thousands of websites, it's really hard to clean up. And at that point, you're talking uh, just trying to get some kind of compensation for the harm that you've suffered. But in have a lot there been any cases of that happening where people have received compensation for false internet information? Um, uh, certainly there have been some uh, cases where people have uh, recovered for false uh, information on the internet. There's also cases where people have uh, dealt with true information on the internet. One story is the Star Wars kid. Uh, this is a young teenager, about 15 years old in Canada. He um, filmed himself waving a golf ball retriever as a pretending it was a lightsaber and unfortunately he didn't have uh, George Lucas's uh, choreographers to make him look particularly good doing this um, and uh, as a result uh, his uh, enemies or tormentors put this online on a kind of YouTube like video sharing site millions of people around the world download in fact actually it was tens of millions of people people mocked this kid people made uh, videos where they enhanced it with special effects so that the lightsaber glowed. Um, they had Star Wars music and the, the text streaming across the screen. Uh, and so it was, uh, uh, imagine already being teased in high school, uh, but now you're teased by the entire world. Uh, this kid actually dropped out of school. He had to seek counseling. Uh, this was in Canada. He sued the uh, people who put it up there, and I believe that they settled. Um, the terms of the settlement are confidential, so I don't know what exactly that settlement was for. Um, but he suffered greatly uh, for uh, this, this incident. And will forever be known as the Star Wars kid. Exactly. If you Google his name, uh, you'll pull up a Wikipedia entry. Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia. You'll pull, pull up a Wikipedia entry for him as the Star Wars kid. Um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of links talking about him. You write in your book that uh, the future of the Internet involves not only the clash between freedom and control, but also a struggle within the heart of freedom itself. What does that mean? Well, a lot of the early writing on the Internet focused on, well, the Internet could be a world of, of radical freedom, um, where anyone can say anything, a place where government could have difficulty regulating, and uh, this could really be an enhancement for freedom. On the other hand, um, the thing that I look about uh, in my book is the fact that the Internet's freedom uh, can actually conflict with itself. 
on the one hand, you have free speech and the notion that anyone can say anything to anybody around the world and that it's freedom enhancing and allows people to express themselves. On the other hand, privacy could be implicated. People's reputations can be harmed, and that can limit people's freedom. It could limit people's autonomy. It can make people less free. It could shackle them to their paths, make it harder to experiment and try new things without worrying about um, what's going to happen to them, and hold people back. And so we have two incredibly important values, freedom, I'm sorry, uh, free speech and privacy. And I don't think we, it, what makes it so difficult is you can't, sacrifice one for the other. So it's not easy to say, let's just get rid of free speech and protect privacy. But I think it's also improper to say, and not a good thing to say, let's protect uh, free speech and do nothing about privacy. Uh, so we need a balance between the two. And when they clash, um, we're going to have to give up a little freedom on each side. We have two good things that are coming into conflict. You write that uh, in American history, we've gone from riots to duels to laws. Where are we with regard to the internet? Well, we're seeing, I think, difficulties. The law is struggling to really take hold and deal with the internet. I mean, it used to be in the past that before we really had uh, adequate legal remedies, people wanted to still vindicate their reputation. So that's why people resorted to duels. Duels are a thing of the past. We, if someone's reputation is injured, they respond by using the law. However, one of the problems is that the law is really struggling to deal with protecting privacy and reputation online. And the way the law currently is, it's actually held back by uh, antiquated understandings of privacy, which make it, I think, woefully ineffective in addressing this problem. And so we're starting to see a world where um, people whose reputations are harmed online are, are not with adequate tools to vindicate themselves. Are there any legislative actions being taken by states or by Congress, courts, uh, to, to restrict the Internet in any way? Well, I do see certain things happening in the states. I haven't seen much at the, the federal level, but at the state level, there are certain proposals, especially after certain cases will arise or a, a high-profile case, uh, various proposals are proposed. Uh, a lot of them I actually don't agree with. A lot of them I actually think are, are too restrictive of free speech. There are some that uh, you know, try to restrict anonymous speech and someone can't post something with a pseudonym or anonymously or try to cut back on that. Which there are, states have uh, pursued those? Um, this was actually a pursued a bit in a, um, uh, an, an ordinance uh, in uh, Missouri after a, a case involving a fake uh, MySpace profile. The about, suicide of the teenage girl. Exactly, the Megan Meyer case. Right. And uh, it didn't actually directly restrict it, but it, it was, I think, a very broad, overbroad law that, that I think curtail too much anonymous speech. Um, there's also proposals about, um, uh, and this is nothing's really materialized, but requiring ID checks for people to use social network websites, which again I don't think is going to be effective. I think it will limit uh, and make it harder for a lot of people um, to use them. And there's something bad about these sites, something inherently bad about blogging or using social network websites. I actually think for the most part, they're good. Uh, so what we want to do is prevent harm to others and make sure that people are, are, are blogging and using social network websites responsibly. But we don't want to stop them from doing it. Um, with regard to the, the Megan case in Missouri, um, it was almost a posse that went after the mother. Is that correct? What happened? Well, uh, the case involves this, this uh, mother of, of, of another teenager who wanted to find out what was, going, what was being gossiped about by, about her own daughter. So she created a fake profile of this guy, uh, this, this teenage guy, and befriended uh, an, uh, th this other girl. And then ultimately this fake profile uh, broke up in a very nasty way with this girl because they became very good friends. And this girl uh, committed suicide as a result. Uh, it's a terribly tragic case. Uh, when this story came to light and when it was reported, the newspaper did not put details about uh, the woman's identity online for fear that people would retaliate. Well, uh, bloggers started to find this information, post the name of this person, and as a result, people started really piling on with tons of criticism and, and attacks and threats and other things. And, and so I think one of the dangers of this is that it 
creates a kind of mob psychology that when people all get together and are trying to outdo each other and you can spread information and, and, and congregate so quickly, um, I think that people start to lose a sense of proportion, a sense of judgment, um, things become anarchic, uh, and it becomes much harder to have any kind of social control, any kind of due process, any kind of uh, fair hearing of things, uh, any limit to, to what can happen. But the public records are also online. Weren't they able to find this, this woman's address and, and drive by her house and throw things at the house? What about public records online? Well, I think that's, that's a very interesting issue because on the one hand, we want transparency. We want to have public records where people can find out information about uh, the government. I do think that increasingly public records online are being used in ways that are not to further the purpose of public records, which I think is transparency for the government. It's to make sure that we can be watchdogs of what our government is doing. And increasingly we're seeing that public records are being used a lot by commercial entities which are gathering them all in big gigantic databases, um, which are then used by marketers and, and others uh, to uh, find out personal information about people. So public records, which were designed to kind of show a window into the government, are actually, I think, now being used uh, to show a window into people's private lives. And actually, ironically, um, one of the big, uh, th th these companies uh, that gather them, some of their customers are actually government agencies. So the government is using these records as a way to look in the windows of people and find out information about us. And again, are there any restrictions on that, the use of that type of public information? Well, once it's in a public record, the Supreme Court has held that you cannot be penalized for uh, further disseminating that information. So if it's in a public record and the government puts it there, um, you can't have uh, liability under tort or you can't sue someone for posting it or you can't criminalize spreading that information. Uh, so uh, the decision to put it in the public record um, is something that I think needs to be thought about uh, more carefully because there's a lot of information that people would be surprised um, to find about themselves in public records. And some of this information could really uh, hurt people, including even putting their address in there. There are people who have very good reasons to not want to have their addresses known. Uh, they could be under threat. An example could be an abortion doctor who's afraid that if their address is known, someone's going to attack them or their family. Or it could be a domestic violence victim who does not want their address known uh, so that they can be tracked down by their uh, abusive uh, spouse. So uh, have there been cases where that's happened via the internet and have there been restrictions put on again post case? Well one of the, there was one fairly well known case uh, happened a few years back where um, this stalker uh, went to a, 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 web, a commercial website to try to find out information about uh, his potential victim and he uh, found out her social security number and found out other information, found out her work address uh, and then went out and killed her uh, in, in one uh, fairly well-known case. It's uh, uh, Remsburg versus DocuSearch. And so what happened? Why, why did it become a case? Well, uh, her family sued the uh, database company. And in a fairly uh, novel uh, holding, uh, the court said that, in fact, that company could be liable to the family because uh, they did nothing to sort of check the background of this person who was getting this information and as a result um, by spreading this information to uh, this this person they uh, were a factor in causing the harm to uh, th this woman. And has that case been used as maybe a precedent setting case or has it been looked at by other legislative districts? I haven't really seen it go much further than that. It's actually a fairly radical decision. Um, it's fairly recent. I think it was decided back in 2003. Uh, I think that we, I really haven't seen it develop that far, but it's very young. It's very early in, in, in the, uh, uh, the day for a lot of these cases. And we're really seeing this is a really young body of law. It's really being formed right now. And so there's often a lot of open questions and a lot of things that are up for grabs at this point. We are talking with Daniel Solov. He is the author of The Future of Reputation, Gossip, Rumor, and Privacy on the Internet. He's also a professor at George Washington University here in Washington. Um, and here in the Washington area recently, a school administrator's wife called a student 
and after the student had called about, you know, why aren't we out of school on a snow day, the administrator's wife called the student back. We want to play that, and I want to get your reaction to it. This message is for Dave Corey. How dare you call us at home? If you've got a problem with going to school, you do not call somebody's house and complain about it. My husband was up at 4 o'clock this morning trying to decide the best thing to do to send you to school on a day when the weatherman is calling for one thing and another thing happens. You don't begin to know what you are talking about. And don't you ever call here again. My husband has been at the office for six this morning, so don't you even suggest that he purposely didn't answer his phone. He is out almost every single night of the week at meetings for snotty nosed little brats. And he may not have called you, but it is not because he's home, because it snowed. Get over it, kid, and go to school. Get an education, that's what you're there for. That got on the internet. Exactly. And I think it raises a lot of fascinating questions. On the one hand, I think that this message that uh, the woman left was totally inappropriate uh, and over the top. On the other hand, uh, this was intended to be a private call. This was not intended to get out on the internet for the world to see. And uh, this person's expectations of what happened to this call um, were sort of wildly upset by the putting it on the internet. And once it gets on the internet, it gets out of control. So a lot of people were starting to make this into an incredibly big story. The person who put it up, uh, I saw in one interview, regretted that and said, in fact, that he really wished this whole thing would, would go away. And uh, sometimes it's like creating Frankenstein. You've created a monster that uh, sometimes gets out of your control in a lot of these cases. So should there be a solution to something like that? Well, that's a difficult thing. I think maybe. Um, the tough thing is that once it happens, it's really hard to, to do much about it. What we want to do is try to make sure that it doesn't happen, because uh, little things like this are happening all the time. So what we want to do is have people realize the consequences of what they're doing when they put something online before it actually happens, before they do it, because I think people aren't really thinking it through. And oftentimes when the consequences come, people are shocked and surprised about it. There's one instance where a, a journalist went to various uh, uh, MySpace pages and uh, that had contact information and would call people up and say, I was looking at your MySpace page and I saw it. You know, what do you think about that? And they were shocked. Oh my gosh, this, this weird stranger called me. And the journalist said, well, you put it out there. You put it there. Anyone could see this. So it just shows the disconnect in people's minds between what they're putting online and their awareness of who can see it, they think, oh, just my friends are going to see it. Just a few people are going to see it. Uh, they don't really think through the consequences. So part of, I think, the solution is trying to get people to understand the full implications of what they're doing. Uh, has the Federal Communications Commission looked at this issue at all? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I haven't really uh, looked at precisely what, what they're doing, uh, so I really couldn't speak to their their efforts in this regard. Is it fair to still characterize the internet or the World Wide Web as the wild, wild west? I think part of it is. Part of it actually is fairly controlled. And so you have a kind of combination. Some, some of it is wild west. But I do think there are other parts that are, in fact, um, very tightly controlled. So it's a kind of very mixed world of all sorts of things. Cyber cops. I want to talk about cyber cops. You cite an example of community activists uh, in Peoria, Illinois. What is that? Well, these uh, neighbors got tired of crack houses that were in their neighborhoods. And so they would uh, they created a website uh, for, uh, to sort of out these crack houses and try to draw attention to them. And so they would take pictures of the house and they'd put information about the owners of the house and, and their families and other things uh, to try to take action, take the law into their own hands. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine to report the house to the police and to try to get the police to take action. But what if they were wrong? What if they put some information up about someone's house and they weren't involved or they got the wrong people? Sometimes it was their kids and, and other people who were also uh, had their personal information online. What if they weren't involved in this? So I really worry about the consequences of everybody deciding 
to take the law into their own hands and do what they think is right. And it's one thing if they're actually correct, but what if they're not? You quote Judge Richard Posner as saying that the blogosphere as a whole has a better error correction machinery than the conventional media do. How so? Well, in the blogosphere, uh, because information spreads so rapidly, uh, people will respond to what's been written and oftentimes they'll say that's false or people will really uh, investigate and look into it and then correct things very quickly. Uh, so you can have, I think, uh, uh, people collectively looking at stories and, and trying to ferret out errors and trying to correct the record. And so I think it can work very effectively. On the other hand, it can fail too uh, because people can be wrong. People might not have all the facts. Um, the true information might not always rise to the top. Are other countries doing things differently than the U.S. when it comes to, I don't know, regulating the Internet? Well, a lot of other countries are, are more restrictive. I mean, the, the examples I know are, for instance, China, which is incredibly restrictive on the Internet. I think that's far too authoritarian a model for what, for what we're doing uh, for, for the United States. And so uh, I ultimately think that, by and large, I'm not recommending radical changes. I actually think that sort of any kind of strong restriction would, would push too much in the reputation department and be too chilling of free speech. So what I think one of the best things to do is have uh, the tort system, the private lawsuits, initiated uh, not by the government but by individuals who are harmed. And ultimately that system I think can work the best because it's, it's sort of less restrictive, uh, it's less government imposed, and it allows people hopefully uh, these cases are not going to be a whole blizzard of lawsuits. We'll see people settling and, and if they fear that they could be sued, uh, if people bring a case, uh, hopefully uh, the, the courts push these things into mediation and people settle a lot of these things on their own without resorting to a full-blown lawsuit. What do you teach at GW? I teach uh, information privacy law. I also teach law and literature, criminal procedure, and criminal law. Daniel Solove. He's a professor and the author of The Future of Reputation, Gossip, Rumor, and Privacy on the Internet. Thanks for speaking with us. Thanks so much for having me.